there that you need to practice, practice, practice limits. It's very important that you practice limits, that you understand limits quite well. Um, if you haven't done homework two, please do homework two. It must be handed in at the start of the tutorial. So please go early to your respective tutorials. And lastly, as advertised, you have been sufficiently warned. In your tutorial this week, you will be writing a class test on domain and surfaces. So a mock example is on ClickUp. And what are we doing today? Today we are finishing chapter two. So we are finishing off limits. So we're going to do chapter 2.3 and 2.4 in one lesson. Can I get a smiley face that you guys are ready to rock and roll to finish off chapter two today so that in the next lesson we can jump into chapter three, which is how do we do differentiation when we have functions of many variables? So yes, we are definitely not taking any prisoners. We are moving forwards, onwards and upwards because there are so much cool mathematics to learn. So we can't stop doing mathematics. Again, please practice limits. So when you do limits, the typical tricks will be the triangle inequality and a lot of problems use the fact that the absolute value of a is the square root of a squared. You would have seen from last week's examples or the worked out examples in the textbook. But limits do not always exist. And we are going to spend a little bit of time today talking about the non-existence of limits. It's very important that you understand limits well and also look at the proofs in the textbook. Some are done in the textbook and some are left as exercises. Now, what we have here is epsilon delta definition for both. On the left hand side is the epsilon delta definition for the limit to exist. On the right hand side, using the rules of negation, is the epsilon delta definition for the limit not to exist. So on the left is the epsilon delta definition for the limit to exist. And on the right is the epsilon delta definition for the limit not to exist. Are there any questions? So if you have a limit problem, it can either exist or not exist. And the formal definition for existence is on the left and non-existence is on the right. All right. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions. Now, Proving non-existence is hard with the epsilon delta definition. That is my first remark. Can I get a thumbs up if you're planning to do WTW2220? You can give me a yes. You can give me a thumbs up. There's a couple of you guys planning to do WTW2220. If that is you, please work through example 44 where you see how they use the non-existence of a limit to show in example 44 that the limit doesn't exist. So this is very important for your mathematical growth, especially if you're planning to do a third year in mathematics. So work through example 44. If you have a friend, explain it to your friend. But that way is quite clumsy and tedious so we need a better way to show the non-existence of a limit and there is a better way to show the non-existence of limit now remember in theorem 43 and i hope this was one of the things that you did this weekend if the limit exists then it means that all paths go to l so if the limit exists that's theorem 43 in the textbook then all, no matter which path you take, no matter which continuous path you take, they all go to L. Now, what we can do is we can do something quite sneaky, which is the contrapositive. 
some textbooks claim this idea originated in 1870. It's the idea of the contrapositive. So if you've never heard the word contrapositive, put it on your to-do list today to read up, ask Dr. Google or Professor Wikipedia, what is contrapositive? So contrapositive tells us that from theorem 43, we can make an, an equivalent theorem that says that not all paths to L so if not all continuous paths go to L, that implies that the limit does not exist. So the limit does not exist. That is the contrapositive. So have a look in your logic notes from last year or ask Dr. Google or Professor Wikipedia. Now, a better way to state that is the following. And I'm going to use theorem 45 in the textbook and it goes as follows. Consider a function from R squared to R and consider two continuous paths. I'm labeling the continuous paths R1 bar and R2 bar. Can I get a smiley face that you guys are with me? So if it's a function of two variables and we have two paths, so it's a vectored valued function from the one to four nodes. So the one we label as R1 bar and the other one we label as R2 bar. So that's the first thing underlined in blue. The one there is we need to continue vector valued function, R1 bar and R2 bar. Then we have the following condition that if I plug C into the first path or C into the second path, I get the vector AB. So that's my second condition. We're also going to assume there is a delta zero bigger than naught, so that R1T is not the point AB and R2T is not the point AB whenever the absolute value of T minus C is between zero and delta zero. So what this is saying is that you have a path visiting AB when time is C, but when time is not C, it is close to the point AB. And then what theorem 45 says is the following. If the limit as P goes to C of F of R1 bar T and the limit T goes to C of F R2 bar T, if one of them do not exist, or if they both exist and they have different values, then the limit as XY approaches the point AB of FXY do not exist. So in human terms, this is saying if you have going to two different values the standard limit does not exist but here is a more mathematical way of saying it if you can find two paths you can label the one path r1 bar you label the other path r2 bar with conditions can i get a yes that you guys see the conditions these paths must be continuous when you plug in a certain value, you must get the point. When you plug in values close to the point, when, when T is close to C, then you are visiting 2D vectors, which is not the point AB. So there are three conditions here that you need to state that they have been satisfied. So if you look at the limit of the one path and you look at the limit of the other path and one of them don't exist, or they are different values, then the limit do not exist. Are there any questions? Theorem 45 is a mouthful, but it is a much smarter way of showing that limits do not exist. And there are some beautiful examples in the textbook. Please do them. Theorem 45 is a beautiful result that allows us to show in an easy way that the limit do not exist. There's a question, thank you for the question. So if any of the three conditions are not satisfied, nope, nope, nope. Logically, if one condition fails, you cannot use theorem 45. So Ms. Dube, so, if the three conditions are satisfied, you can use theorem 45. But if one of the three conditions aren't satisfied, you can't use theorem 45. So it could be that the limit may or may not exist. 
Ms. Dubik, can I get a thumbs up or a smiley face that you see the logic? So a theorem is very different to a definition. So for a theorem, if the conditions are satisfied, you can use the theorem. Okay. So make sure that you are comfortable with how to use a theorem. All righty. That is a beautiful question, Ms. Dubé. Thank you for that beautiful question. All right. So this is the kind of questions that you can expect. Let f be a function of two variables. So if you're at the origin, the output is one. If you're not at the origin, the output is given by this expression. So guys, it's very important that you're comfortable with piecewise functions. I quickly want to do a poll. Guys, you will see we, we like this quite often in this course having piecewise functions. If the input is a zero vector, the output is one. But if the input is not the zero vector, then the output is given by this expression. So if you have forgotten how to play with piecewise functions, revise your first year notes. But piecewise functions are actually very nice to allow us to define interesting functions. And the reason why we do this piecewise function, because then the domain of this function is the entire 2D plane. Because if I want to plug in the zero vector, this gets activated, so the output will be one. But if I plug in a non-zero vector, then this part gets activated. That is the reason why a lot of the time, thank you for voting, we make use of piecewise functions because this function then gives us a, a function whose domain is the entire 2D plane. So you can plug any 2D vector into F. So please be comfortable with piecewise functions. All right. So the question says use theorem 45 and prove that the limit does not exist. So how do you do this? You need two paths going to two different values. So we start with easy paths and we hope for the best. We start with easy paths and we hope for the best. So we're going to the origin. So we are going to go to the origin. Can anybody give me an easy path going to the origin? So we want to visit the origin. I'm going to color the origin pink. Can anybody in the chat give me easy paths that goes to the origin. Vian, I like y equal to x, but you guys are giving me complicated paths. Yes, let's do that. All right, let's do the path x equal to zero. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see this green path traveling along the y axis? Surely that's an easy path, right? Yeah, much easier. Right? Don't don't go complicated. Use a vertical path or a horizontal path. Don't walk around like a drunk person along a parabola or a lin function or any funny curve. Use a straight line path, a vertical path or a horizontal path. Now remember, when you do a path, it has to be in the form from time giving you an output so who can give me what is the path the vertical path when x is equal to zero yes can i get a smiley face that this is the vector value function that i'm looking for well done ben well done miss Dubé. can i get more smiley faces this is a path. This is the path. So if you plug in random t values, you're going to get points on the y axis. So here you have a path along the y axis. Can I get more smiley faces? Ladies and gentlemen, talk to me. You see how chapter vector valued functions from one to four is making an appearance. So you need a path along the y axis. 
So here's a path along the y-axis. How many conditions do we have? How many conditions do we have? Yes, we have three conditions. Now each component is continuous. So you can just say R1 is continuous. And to visit the origin, so to visit the origin, what value do I plug in for in this path to get to the origin? What value do I plug into the origin? Yep. You see, if I plug naught into this path, I get naught naught, which is the origin. And I see also that RT is not the origin if T is not equal to zero. So here I have the path is continuous. When C is naught, I visit the point where I'm traveling to, which is the origin. And you can see that if T is non-zero, then I'm at a point which is not the origin. So I have satisfied all three conditions. Are there any questions? Give the path as a vector valued function. That's one line. Then you need to show that all three conditions are met. This is very important. No, there's no need to give a reason, Ben. It's quite clear the first component is continuous, the second component is continuous. So by first year mathematics, R1 is continuous. But I just want to see that you are aware that you can't just use any path. You need to use a continuous path. Alrighty, and now we do the math. Now we do the math. Now we see what does the limit become if we travel along this path. So we do the limit as t goes to zero of f of r1 t. This becomes the limit as t goes to zero. So the path is zero t. So in the function, I replace x with naught, y with t. So I get zero squared. Sorry, it's still a limit. It's still a limit as t goes to zero of zero squared plus twice t squared over zero squared plus t squared. And what's the value of this limit? What's the value of this limit? Can I get confirmation? Did you guys agree with Luzuku? Yep. That's two and we're done. Now, let's do another easy path. So let's call it path two. So call it R2 bar. It's a map from R to R squared and R2 bar. Can anybody propose what I'm going to use as my second path? Clarica is going T0. Yeah, let's do that. Let's take a path along the X axis, T0. Let's see what we get. Now each component is continuous. So again, I say R2 is continuous. And I say, if I plug naught into this path, I get the origin. And I see that in this path, we don't visit the origin if T is not equal to zero. Then I do the limit as t goes to zero of f of the path r2. So this becomes the limit as t goes to zero. Now I'm dealing with the path t0. This becomes the limit as t goes to zero using the mass. So it becomes t squared plus zero over t squared plus zero. And what's the answer to this limit? The Zucker saying one. Can I get confirmation? Thank you. I agree. It is one. Are we jumping for joy? Are we jumping for joy? Yes, we are jumping for joy. All right. Tell the marker that. So let's call it conclusion. Two is not equal to one. So the limit as t goes to zero of the first path is not equal to the limit as t goes to zero of the second path. And so what are we going to say? We are going to say the conclusion is if we take the standard 2D limit, so now as xy approaches the origin using any path of the function fxy, we are going to say this do not exist by theorem 45 and we're done. Are there any questions on this proof or this explanation why 
for this function, it doesn't exist. Because one path, if you travel it, the values will be 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, 1.999. So traveling along that path, it appears that the limit of the value could be two. But if you travel along a different path, you get 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99. It's one, but you have two paths. One gives you two, one gives you one. So the limit of the one path is not the limit of the other path so because these values are different. So therefore, it does not exist by theorem 45. A nice little calculation. You can see, very nice because we don't have to use epsilon delta. Alrighty. Now guys, um, as a word of warning, so if you're visiting the origin, typically you will try t0 and 0t. But as people already suggested, you can also try the path t t squared. There are other paths you can try like t to the power m comma t to the power n. For example, you can take traveling along a parabola t t squared or t squared t. Can I get a smiley face that there are infinitely many paths going to the origin? Typically, we will take a vertical path or a horizontal path. But sometimes you need to try another path like TT. Or you got to be a little bit more, more creative and try paths like TT squared or T squared T. So there are infinitely many paths that you try. And you need two paths that gives you two different values. If two paths give you the same value, you need to try a third path. You need to try a fourth path or a fifth path. All right, so very important. So if you want to employ theorem 45, you need two paths. Either one don't exist or you get two different values. So make sure that you understand theorem 45. There doesn't seem to be any questions. So I want to ask a nice question. So here is, it's a, it's a yes, no question. And the question is the following. Does a function of two variables exist such that if all straight line paths to a specific point have the same limit, but the limit of the function do not exist? So I'm going to wait for to hear what the majority of the class thinks. So what does your gut feeling tell you? It's very even at the moment. Mohammed, please vote. Mohammed, please vote. Goodness, it's very close. It's very close. It's this is tricky. All right, this is tricky. It seems 43 is saying no, 40 is saying does such a function exist? And the majority is saying no. All right. <laughs> yeah, the majority is saying no. All right. Now, let me let the cat out of the bag. Is there a comment? If you have a comment, let me know in the chat now. The answer to this question is yes. It's a shocker because the majority of the class thought no, right? Here is one. So if we let the function equal to 2x squared y over x to the power 4 plus y squared, you will see that all straight line paths have the same limit value, but the limit of the function do not exist. Now for fun, who can tell me what straight line through the origin doesn't have a slope? What straight line through the origin doesn't have a slope? You know this from high school. If not, you need to go back to high school. Yes. So x equal to zero is one of them. All right. So I'm going to leave it for you. This is homework. So A, if you use this path, 
when x is node that's a straight line then i also want you to do the following if m is a real number use the path i'm just going to call it r bar t is equal to t m t where t goes to zero then this last one that i want you to do is i want you to use this path r 2 t and so to help us out i'm going to travel along a parabola where t goes to zero so if you do this limit of a and b a and b were all the lines so this is the line with not a slope a is the line without the slope that is x equal to zero b is all the other straight lines with slope m so you will see that all straight lines have the same limit but if you do this path and i dare you to do the calculation today all right um clarica this one is tricky this one is tricky because the limit do not exist. So you can try to draw it with algebra. You can try to draw it with algebra. Um, but what ends up happening here is the following. That if you try them, you will see that the limit as you approach the origin of this function do not exist by theorem 45. Because you can either use A or C, or you could use B or C and you will see that you will have two paths whose limit values are different. So therefore, by theorem 45, this limit do not exist. So here is a very sneaky example where you are forced to use a, a non-straight line path. So here is an, an, an example of a function of two variables where you are forced to use a non-straight line path. So what I want to say with this remark is, that even though the limit along all straight lines exists, it is not enough to conclude that the limit exists. So the warning that I already want to tell you that maths in 2D and 3D can be fun, but you got to be careful. Are there any more questions or comments? So I am leaving this example for you to verify later today. The question is, how should we know what to try? That's a very good question. So step one is you need to develop instinct. So you need to develop instinct. And the first thing is start with easy paths. Start with easy paths. If you hit gold, you find two paths with two different values, you're done. But if you try many paths and they all have the same value, you even try non straight line paths and they have the same value, then you would suspect the limit exists and then you will prove it using chapter 2.2 knowledge. So here is a little summary. Clarica, I hope this helps. If the limit exists, you prove it using the epsilon delta definition like we did last week. And I hope you practice this till the cows came home last week. But if the limit do not exist, using theorem 45, you need two continuous paths with two different values. So i.e. the limit as t goes to c of the one path is not equal to the limit t goes to c of the other path. So there's questions here. Are there functions that people have not been able to verify? Nope. Nope, Clarica. So this is, if the function is well-defined, it falls in one of the two categories. If it exists, and then you can prove it using the epsilon delta definition. If it doesn't exist, you need two continuous paths with two different values. So you either have one of the two scenarios popping up. Either the limit exists, then you use chapter 2.2 knowledge, or the limit do not exist, then you use chapter 2.3 knowledge. Alrighty. So if you know which one of the two it is, you know which weapon to use. However, if we're sneaky and we don't tell you which one of the two it is, then you've got to try one. And if you get stuck, you try the other. Are there any questions on this strategy? So if you know it exists, use chapter 2.2 techniques. If you know it doesn't exist, use the theorem 45. But if you don't know which one of the two it is, try one. 
If you're lucky, you are lucky. You're done and dusted. But if you get stuck, turn gears. Because if you're trying to prove it exists and it doesn't exist, you're not going to get anywhere proving it exists if it doesn't exist. Are there any questions? You see, maths is already getting fun. You're playing with functions of two variables and playing with limits. Can I get another smiley face? So if it exists, chapter 2.2. .2. If it doesn't exist, we need two paths. So we employ theorem 45. All right. So again, you've got to practice, 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 practice this. And the little lesson that I wanted to share with this example is not all paths are straight lines. Alrighty, so you can see how much more fun we are going to have with functions of specifically two variables. If you understand functions of two variables quite well, then you can easily extend this to functions of many variables. All right, now next on our agenda is talking about continuous functions. So in first year, we said a function from R to R is continuous at X equal to C if the limit at X goes to C of FX equal to FC. Now we want to talk about functions of two variables. So again, we want to extend ideas from first year to now functions of two variables. So suppose F is a function of two variables with domain D, which is a subset of R squared. We say F is continuous at point or vector x with coordinates a, b, element of d. If, well, we are not reinventing the wheel. We are taking this pink part and we are rewriting this as follows. So we are going to say the limit. So instead of having x, so we say that 2d vector x, y approaches the point a, b f is a function of two variables, so hence f bracket x, y is equal to, who can tell me how do I complete this definition? Who can tell me how do I complete this definition? Let me know in the chat. So the first definition is a function of one variable being continuous. Yes, guys, you are making me very happy on this Monday. So the limit as x, y approaches a, b, of fxy is equivalent replacing the vector with a b. Are there any questions? So here we have the definition of continuity. So 2.3 is about limits not existing. 2.4 we're changing gears. We are changing gears to talking about when a function is continuous. So the first definition, a function of one variable being continuous, the second definition is when a function of two variables are continuous. Obviously, you can now write down a function of three variables. When is it continuous? A function of four variables. When is it continuous? I'm not going to write all of that down. So if you want to, you are welcome to write that down yourself in your hour or two of maths that you do every day. So here we have what it means for a function of two variables to be continuous at the point a, b, and that obviously have to be in the domain. Alrighty, so I don't see any other questions. Let's move on, all right? Now, just like functions of one variable, we have the following result. Say f and g are functions of two variables, and f and g are continuous at the point a, b, and we define h to be the sum of f and g for any 2D vectors x, y, then it turns out because f is continuous and g is continuous, then if we add it up, we form this new function h, then h is also going to be continuous. So you can make lots of little theorems like that. The sum of continuous functions are continuous. The difference of continuous functions are continuous. The product of continuous functions are continuous. The quotient of continuous functions are continuous provided you're not dividing by zero or you're only focusing on points where the denominator is non-zero. Can I get a smiley face that you guys suspect this? If f and g are continuous, then the sum have to be continuous. All right, no big surprise here. No big surprise here. 
Now, remember when you get a problem where you need to prove something, a good tip is to identify what's given. Can I get a yes that you guys see? What is given is that F and G are continuous at this point. We don't know elsewhere, but this green part, this is given. And the goal is to show that H is continuous at this point. So typically when you do a proof, and you will get a proof in the tutorials and in semester tests and in the exams, you need to work your way from the given information to the goal. So you got to extract so much from the given information to turn it into the goal. So no surprise, a good start would be to start with the given. So let's start with the given. So we can say, okay, F and G are unknown functions, but we know they are continuous at the point AB. So I can write down the following. I can write down the limit as we approach the point AB of F is equal to FAB. And my reason is it's given F is continuous at AB. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? So my first given is that F is an unknown function, but I know it's continuous at AB. So that allows to turn that into an equation using the first given. All right, there aren't any questions. Let me write down the second given. So we also can write down the limit as XY approaches AB of GXY is equal to GAB. And my reason is it's given, this function is called G, it's given G is continuous at AB. Okay. Now, I now need to do something. Who can tell me what is the magic step? Who can tell me what is the magic step to continue using F is continuous and G is continuous. Who can tell me how do I continue from here? Yes, Ms. Radebe. All right, it's a sum limit law. But do I know that if the sum limit law is true? Can anybody confirm how do we know that the sum limit law is true for functions of two variables? How do we know that the sum limit law is true for functions of two variables? All right, so we've got to use a theorem. So both exist. I need a little bit more. Yes, Yaku. Yes, Ben. Can I get a smiley face? We proved this last week. Those of you that attended my lesson from last week, we proved the sum limit law for functions of two variables. Can I get a smiley face? So <laughs> I'm doing things with a reason. Remember last week, and I hope you've written out that proof twice already, I proved the sum limit law, all right? So that is how you continue. So you can say, okay, the limit as we approach the point AB of F and G, that's equal to FAB plus GAB. So you can give any of the two reasons. So you can say um, some uh, limit law, I will accept that. Or if you want to, you can say theorem 42 part one. Any of those two reasons are good. Are there any questions? But I want you to, in your solution, note that we are using the sum limit law, which we proved in class, or you can reference Theorem 42, part one. Are there any questions on this? Okay, there aren't any questions. Now, who can tell me how do I continue? How do I continue from this point? How do I continue from this point? Remember, a proof 
you got to write it beautifully. Yes. All right. So the reason that I'm looking for is the following is that recall H is equal to F plus G or the definition of H gives the following. So remember here we define H apple equals F apple plus G apple. So F apple plus G apple is H apple. So here apple is a 2D vector X, Y. So applying the definition of H, we get the following. So as we approach the vector AB, if apple G apple, that becomes H apple. If apple plus G apple becomes H apple. Are there any questions on what I've written here? So recall H is defined as F plus G, or using the definition of H, the third line turns into this. The third line turns into this. And who can tell me what does this line mean? What does this line mean? This equation. How would you interpret this equation? Indeed. Indeed. So be specific. Guys and girls, be specific. This shows H is continuous at AB as wanted. So I'm going to look for the word H is continuous. Yes. At AB. And we are done. So if F is continuous at a point and G is continuous at the same point and we add them up and we form a new function H, H is also continuous at that point. Are there any questions on this proof? The proof for the sum and the product and the quotient or multiplying by a constant is very similar. You are just going to use the appropriate theorem 42 part whatever. So you can try out those proofs at home. So Theorem 42, one of the parts will come in useful to prove equivalent results. This, again, is a good proof because we move from the given to the goal. We move from the given to the goal. Alrighty. So, cool lesson. The sum of two continuous functions is again continuous. And the proof is quite easy. We get to use theorem 42, the correct part of theorem 42. All right, let's move on. Now, a very important remark. In first year, we learned that polynomials of one variable is continuous everywhere. So a good question we can ask is, how does a polynomial of two variables look like? All righty. And let me give you my answer. How would I explain what is a polynomial of two variables? So the answer, let's call it A1, answer one. So answer one will be the following. So it's an expression that is the sum of terms of the form R x to the n, y to the m, where r is a real number, n is a non-negative integer, and m is a non-negative integer. And let me give you some examples. So like 3 plus x plus x squared y. Another example would be minus 7 plus 5x squared plus 10x cubed y to the power 7. Are there any questions? So you can see this one is 3x to the power 0, y to the power 0. So there you have a term of this form. That is of this form. r is 1, n is 1, m is 0. Are you guys happy with this definition? Let me know in the chat if you're not happy with this definition. So a polynomial of two variables 
is an, an expression that is the sum of terms of the form r x to the n y to the m r can be any real number so it can be 2.5 minus 7.5 but n and m have to be non-negative integers can i get a smiley face that you guys are happy with this definition again you're welcome to google and and find alternative definitions so you can clearly see that there are infinitely many polynomials of two variables you can construct infinitely many polynomials of two variables. You can even make your own example of a polynomial of two variables. All right. So my second question, what do you guys think? Are polynomials of two variables continuous everywhere? So if you pick any point, will it be continuous at that point? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Yeah, this is good news. So the answer to question two is yes. This is very good news. This is actually an exercise in the textbook. So this is exercise 2.4, number three. And in that exercise, you use the result that we just proved that the sum of continuous functions is continuous. So, and you're also going to use the result called the principle of mathematical induction. So I hope you have your one to four notes so that you can revise the principle of mathematical induction. Are you okay with the principle of mathematical induction? So this is a very important result that if you have a function that is a polynomial of two variables, then it is continuous everywhere. And this is a result that we will use quite often in, in chapter three. So if you have never done a problem where you get to use the principle of mathematical induction, please do 10 today. Please do 10 today. You need to understand this proof technique. So if you were naughty last year and you didn't do mathematical induction last year, please do a couple of mathematical induction proofs. You need to know this technique. So this awesome result that a polynomial of two variables is continuous everywhere, that is an exercise in the textbook and that will be a class result that we will use in chapter three onwards. Are there any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? Thank you for voting. So you need to be able to identify what does a polynomial of two variables look like? And you got to know that a polynomial of two variables are continuous everywhere. All right, no questions. All right, guys, remember, you're welcome to ask questions in tutorials. That is why we have tutorials. So please ask questions in tutorials. So next time we're going to do chapter three, please read ahead if you can. And do the exercises to know the work quite well. So please do maths every day. But to finish today's lesson, let's look at this following fun problem. We, as you saw in chapter 2.3, Doing paths is important. So let's quickly do a vertical path to the point two, three. Can anybody give me a formula for a vertical path going to the point two, three? I want to know in the chat, can anybody, nope. Guys, you're giving me equations. So do not give equations anymore. So do not give equations anymore, right? Give me a path. Ladies and gentlemen, I want a path. I want a path. So what I mean by that is path. So I want a function from R to R squared, where if I give you T, what is the 2D vector? All right. 
Um, let's quickly, let's quickly vote. So let's go with this one or let's go with this one. Let's see what the majority thinks. We have two minutes, so we can quickly. So remember, I want a vertical path. All right, don't get confused between the word vertical and horizontal. So I want a vertical path. So it should be a vectored valued function. So it should be a map from, if I give you time, the output will be a 2D vector. So a position in space. So a position in space. So vertical is the green line. Vertical is the green line. So it should be able to visit the point 2.4. I should be able to visit the point 25. So here I'm looking for a vertical path that's going to the point 23. And you can clearly see one way to achieve this is to go 2T as the majority is voting. Thank you for voting. So it's 2T where T is a real number. So for example, if you want to visit that you are going to plug in four. If you want to visit this, you're going to plug in north. If you're going to visit the point two five, you're going to plug in five. Are there any questions? If there's a question, let me know in the chat. So if you're looking for a vertical path to pass through the point two three, then here is one way. It's not the only way, but here's one way. It's a map from R to R squared, where RT is equal to two T, and you can um, say the following that at time three, ah, that's meant to be a three. So remember RC is this, which is two, three. So C is equal to three in that definition. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you <laughs> for spotting that. All right, I'm going to finish the lesson here.